So before we get started, um, Chris, my first question is going to be directed to you. And uh, it has to do with this photo I'm going to put up on the screen. Ah. <laughs> Can you please explain to our delegates in the room what's going on here? Well, I now have a beard. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm a biologist by training, and uh, my area of study is actually spiders. So that thing in my hand is a giant spider puppet. <laughs> And, and when, I was at, when I was doing a photo shoot, they said, bring out a prop. And I said, well, I have this. This will look great. Everyone <laughs> loves spiders. So that's what it is. So I'm, I'm really delighted that now all of you are aware that I own a giant spider puppet. You know what? I think that's the perfect way to start off our systems change panel. Thank you so much. So before we get started, I want to acknowledge that we are actually live streaming this event on Facebook um, and IG. So if you want to go on Facebook, share this uh, live stream with your folks at home, your chapter students at home. We're actually accepting panel questions online. So if you're on the live stream, hello everyone from across Canada. Nice to see you. I'm Brian. Um, if you have questions for our amazing panelists, shoot them in the comments. Our amazing socials team will send them to me on my beautiful little screen right here. And uh, that goes the same for folks here. If you have questions, it's poll EV com and uh, you guys can send questions you folks can send questions to our panelists as well throughout the conversation does that sound okay amazing all right so without further ado let's get started Chris my first question goes to you um, it's not about the spider puppet don't worry so this panel's about solutions right and so we're talking about systems change we're talking about youth engagement our revolution is now with youth, youth engagement in mind, I want to talk about the process. So like, what does it look like for a young person when they want to have a seat at the table? What, what are some steps, like concrete things that we can do as young people to get a seat at the table? What does that process look like? Thanks, Brian, and thank you. Nice to see you all. This is fantastic Sunday morning in Toronto. Uh, wonderful to be here. Uh, systems change. So it's a great question, and I, my, my experience uh, as, a, as an administrator um, is that students have a great deal of energy, passion, you're all here, I know that, uh, but sometimes the actual structure, the framework is really complex and confusing, and it's about a governance structure in an institution. I'm not trying to put you to sleep here talking about governance structures and policies, but all of the institutions that you're, you're involved with have a governance structure and have policies. The next step to me is uh, real strong collaboration and engagement within that framework so we move beyond awareness to systems change. That requires, you write, a seat at the table, but it's a special kind of seat. It's not just a seat at the table, it's a seat at the table uh, with purposeful objectives, shared objectives, and working on, and all of you I know in your institutions, you're, you're aware that there's a policy framework. So it's an idea, the idea is find out what policies matter with respect to mental health, right? what policies really matter, and then get a seat at those tables when those policy revisions happen, when there's a chance to advocate with an ally in the administration on policy change. That affects thousands of people at all institutions because policy, our institutions are self-governing with policies, right? So that's, I know, I can go on for, I'm not going to go on for too long, but I, I wanted to just say that it's, it's really about getting a seat at the right kind of table, which is often around building a framework, a governance framework for making change. It's not boring work. In fact, it's really exciting work. We think about all of you are going to be faced at one time with having to ask for an accommodation for a final exam or a midterm exam. What does that process look like? What are the barriers in place when it comes to thinking about accommodations? How does that affect mental health and well-being? How does it affect... Uh, you know, having to ask a professor or an instructor for an accommodation when you're suffering with mental health. There's a policy behind that, and that's where change can happen. Uh, it's interesting you brought up the governance structure. So I, I do want to follow up with that because um, we talked a lot about um, backstage and, and before, we talked a lot about um, youth advisory boards and the role that they play in a university structure. Talk to me a little bit about um, the role of the youth advisory board and, and whether or not we should be voting members on, on teams. So what's your thoughts on, on the governance structure? I know you're like, that's boring. I think yeah. it's really interesting. <laughs> not Maybe boring, I'm it's just exciting. nerdy, I don't know. I think it's I'm interesting. I'm nerdy too, yeah, yeah. I, I hear you. Um, so I think 
many, many, so in, in my institution, our, our student services unit has different units. There's counseling services, there's uh, Office of Students with Disabilities, uh, First People's House, et cetera. Those units all have their own advisory panel and uh, student representation on those advisory panels is very strong. In fact, it's, it's often 50-50, not always, but often. Mm -hmm. So part of it is, and those are advisory, okay? So that's not a voting panel, but it's a very, very strong voice. There are relatively few places when student voices have a, have a vote per se. That, that's generally, generally the way that, that universities and institutions are structured is there's decision-making bodies. Often there aren't, uh, aren't, aren't the proper, what I would view necessarily representation of students on mm -hmm. those. But uh, getting on those panels and working with the chairs of those groups to say, I want more students on this panel. And that's actually, it's finding allies within, the, within that structure to, and then working with them and saying, how do I get myself on this advisory panel? How do I get my friends on there? We want a voice there. Can we meet more often, please? I want more meetings. I, I want more, more opportunities to discuss policy. I want more opportunities for, for change. Working with chairs of those, getting on those advisory panels, and that builds over time. There are different committees at the, at the institution that are parity, students mm -hmm. and staff, for example. We need to move towards that, especially when it's committees that directly affect students and student well-being. Does that answer the question? It absolutely does. I, I'm so glad you brought this up because I, so in my advocacy work, I have the pleasure of working with folks who are older, and I often say the older and wiser generation. That's the easiest way to get older folks to like you when you call them wise. So I have the pleasure of working with the older and wiser generation. And I think what you mentioned about finding allies is so critical and crucial. And like these three folks are our allies, you know? And it's important to find our allies when we're working to change systems because we can't do this alone, you know? Like we need to engage in those tough conversations and, and engage and, and find those allies and get a seat at the table and then move forward. So and just one last quick point. There are a lot of allies out there. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think there's so many um, people that work within the governance structure of your institution that care deeply about mental health, but they have a different they have a different time frame sometimes, and it's not always clear that they're allies, but they are. There's a lot of allies out there, and it's around developing relationships and conversations and keeping it going. There are many, many allies. Thank you so much. Councillor, my, my next question is for you, and, and you know, we're talking about youth engagement and, and such. We had a really interesting conversation backstage and, and before about climate change. And I know you're a very passionate climate change advocate. I think climate change is one of our foremost issues as young people that we are facing right now. And I think oftentimes when we're talking about climate change, it's folks who are older and wiser than us who have a seat at the table, but those that are impacted, our generation, we don't get a seat at that table. How important is it for young people to be involved in decisions and policy decisions decisions that impact us as a generation? It's critically important. I think one of the things that I see as a deficit in government decision making, uh, especially at the City of Toronto, is that oftentimes uh, councillors such as myself or elected representatives, we sit in a bit of an echo chamber, uh, which means that uh, we're only listening to ourselves, and if you're not at the decision making table or participating through the, the standing committee uh, structure, those voices are lost. Um, if I take a look at uh, my colleagues across City Council, uh, it, it swings and, and tilts predominantly white, uh, straight, um, middle-aged, property owner, owning, and male. And so those will be the voices and positions uh, of interest that will be continually uh, serviced and lobbied for. And we do see a, a massive deficit of, uh, of young people uh, making decisions at City Hall and participating in even um, the, the deputation process or participating in advisory committees unless it's very youth specific. So it, uh, it, becomes, uh, it becomes a bit of an echo chamber, so we're always right. If I ask myself and look at myself in the mirror and say, hey, how, how, are, you going, how are you doing today? I'd be like, I'm okay. And that ends up uh, being what happens at City Council on, on many occasions. It, thank you so much, Councillor, and, and I, I, I completely agree with you. We had so many conversations about this, um, so I, I know how passionate you are about having those voices represented at the table, so thank you. Brunella, I, I want to turn it to you quickly. I'm seeing a, a question on the screen that's talking about how do we change systems of oppression as an individual, and I know that that's something that, that you're working on through your RISE initiative, working with vulnerable youth. So I want to talk to you about how important it is to have lived experience at the table. You know, we're talking about youth and a revolution is now, you know, how important is it to have a variety of voices at the table? Yeah, no, I think um, that that's critical to have people at the table that have lived experience. 
Um, and so I think for myself, because I'm someone who has lived experience dealing with poverty and dealing with a lot of the challenges that the youth that I work with do, that I can speak to certain issues and bring, I think, a certain nuance to discussions that a lot of policymakers, um, academics, and people that are sitting at the table typically have. And so I always, so when I started the RISE initiative, it was partially to work with and support vulnerable youth, but also to create awareness and to understand that if I have a voice, to use my voice to be able to support these causes that will directly impact vulnerable youth. And so since doing that, I've had a couple opportunities um, to sit on different panels. I recently completed my first deputation at City Hall. And she was I, great. <laughs> yes, thank you. And I think that because a lot of people were coming from a lens of academia or policy, and I was able to come and speak really just from the heart and say, I know what it's like. I work with young people, mm -hmm. young people who deal with homelessness, deal with mental health, deal with substance abuse issues. And I know what that's like because I experienced many of those things myself. And so I know the different services that council are voting for. I can understand and I can vouch for the value and the necessity of them. So I think it's critical to have people with lived experience on the yeah. table. I'm so glad you brought up your deputation and I want to talk more about this with both you and the councillor. So we know, um, for those of you that, that don't know, um, Toronto has a youth equity strategy that's currently, uh, currently being voted on in terms of budgetary um, Am I right about this, Councillor? Uh, yes, yeah. that is correct. So there is a youth equity strategy at the City of Toronto. It, it, it's trying to um, address the service gap, so things that, uh, uh, that Chris was speaking about in terms of services um, and structural deficits and, and governance uh, not being there in place. Um, and, uh, and that particular strategy uh, is only as good as if, if it's funded. Mm -hmm. And if it's not funded, if it's not operationalized, uh, then it doesn't get done. It's just another report sitting on the shelf. And that's what's before City Council. Um, and uh, it will be voted on on March the 7th. And we'll find out then if it gets funded or if it's just another report that sits on the shelf which we do not want. So there's 110 recommendations that are addressing issues around housing and vulnerable youth and, and uh, youth programming and, and all, these, all these things. So I'm going to throw the first question to Renal. How important is this youth equity strategy to the vulnerable youth that you work with in Toronto? Yeah, so um, the youth, equ youth equity strategy is it's absolutely vital. And so the reason why, because it applies a very holistic approach to addressing the needs of vulnerable youth. So a lot of programs will focus just on one thing. So say it's educational opportunities, resume building, which we know is important for young people. But if you don't have access to mental health, if you don't have a safe home to go to, if you're waking up to gunshots, and so it means you're not getting a good night's sleep, if you don't have food, so you're going to school hungry, then I mean, a resume building workshop is helpful, but it really doesn't do much if you don't have sort of that holistic approach and all those services working together to improve the lives of young people. And so that's why, for me, why I want to advocate and why the councillor and everyone else really sees the value in this strategy. Councillor, you called the housing crisis in Toronto, you said it was a state of emergency, that, that we are in an emergency here with the housing crisis, homeless, the homeless population, et cetera. Mm -hmm. How important um, would this strategy be to addressing some of those issues? How important is as a lens of the social determinants of health? You know, I think often when we're talking about our mental health care system, we often just think it means health care, which means that it's not the municipal government that can do anything, it's the provincial government who mandates health care. What is the role of the municipal government in ensuring that we have access to positive mental health supports? Um, I would say that if from from a strictly legislative framework, then yes, absolutely, mental health is the uh, uh, under the provision of the provincial governments and oftentimes funded by the by the federal government. But let's let's be real: cities and and uh, local governments are where the services are in terms of delivery, and that means that uh, kids and youth and everyone else will recognize those services because they're coming from the local health providers and their local hospital and. And what I find to be a bit of a gap in terms of how we coordinate and work together, uh, especially through governments, is that we're not, uh, it, we're not taking a holistic approach. There isn't some wraparound. Uh, when I asked City Council to, to declare homelessness and our housing crisis in Toronto a state of emergency, I specifically wanted 
us to be compelled to work th with three orders of government so we can actually deliver that service without the siloing effect. Um, there's 9,000 people who are sleeping rough on the streets in Toronto. You probably walked over them and around them even coming to the design exchange today. And there are uh, 16,000 people who are on the wait list for supportive housing, and that means housing uh, where they cannot live independently. And then there's 181,000 people who are on the wait list for social housing, some type of subsidies so that they can uh, you know, make ends meet and, and sort of move on with their lives. This is a housing crisis in Toronto. And, uh, and of course, we can't fix this by ourselves, um, and people didn't get there on their own. There are structures and systems that failed them along the way where they were not able to get help, not be able to stay uh, housed, and, uh, and then somehow we're, we're now uh, grappling with it. And that means that if people are, are um, you know, living precariously because they're underwaged or perhaps we're working three jobs or single parents that aren't able to get access to affordable uh, childcare, uh, it goes on and on. LGBT youth uh, is another uh, category, four times to, to seven times uh, more chances of, of committing suicide. 40% uh, of our street-involved population is LGBT identified. We don't have enough systems and services in place to keep people housed and healthy. So it costs a lot more if we have to catch them downstream than if we can get them upstream. Thank you so much. So I, I hear you touching on, on some, some pushback, right? So there's pushback within government, there's, there's pushback within budgetary um, concerns, right? And, and I, I want to turn this to Chris for a sec because um, as I'm sure many of you know, and as I'm sure you know, oftentimes there can be the same thing in our university uh, structures, right? Um, in our acad academic structures, higher um, inst institutions of learning, et cetera. The top question there I'm reading says, Chris, do you have advice for handling institutional pushback against student mental health initiatives? I would even go further to say against, you know, uh, the move towards a more inclusive mental health approach for students. <laughs> Good question. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for whoever wrote that down. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an issue, right? Because... Uh, a lot of it has to do with timelines and objectives, right? Because, you know, students have a, a, a shorter time window at an institution than, than mm -hmm. s staff and administrators. So there's, that's an issue, right? There's, there's, there's automatically a, a slowness to institutions. And that can be really, really frustrating for students that are engaged with, with this topic of mental health. So how do you handle institutional pushback? Well, my advice is to be extremely strategic in how to approach the issue. What I mean by that is thinking very carefully around what parts of the institution um, are directly related to mental health and, and well-being. And I'm, I'm on a bit of a tangent here, but stay with me. <laughs> so what I mean is that we all know that when we think about mental health, uh, there's many, many factors that affect mental health and well-being. There are societal factors, There's, we talked about homelessness, we talked about uh, a little bit about poverty, there's all sorts of factors at play. So when you're at your school or your college or your university, what, what levers do, does the university sort of control that affect mental health and well-being? So, and that's where to put the energy into. Because that's where there's that, that, that when you put a Venn diagram around interests by administrators and interests of students, the overlapping space there is a healthy classroom environment. And the idea that, that that's actually where, that's the shared, the shared goal is um, how do we create a healthy teaching and learning environment at any institution of, of, of education. And this is a long answer to your question, but I'm really going to get there. <laughs> the idea is how do you handle pushback? Will you be strategic in, in finding the, the, the right uh, aspect to devote the energy to where there is that shared experience and have patience and have clear objectives on that? In other words, looking to, to affect mental health at an institution broadly is way too challenging, mm -hmm. and that's too big. And sometimes the problems are so, so big and challenging that you don't even know how to start. So starting at that level, and you're going to find allies, getting on those advisory boards yep. that we talked about, getting on those policies that are, that are affecting that change, and then slowly over time and have patience and know that the work you do is going to dramatically help those two or three years behind you. It's not about exactly. quick change. Quick change does not happen at institutions. 
And that's something that just, that's just a fact. Yeah. It's really, really hard to have change happen quickly. So play the long game, be strategic, very objective driven, and then find allies, get on those boards, mm -hmm. and work and work and work. So that, and then you won't have pushback. Because I mean that, you won't, because that's, those are the, that's the shared goal. That's the spot where administrators and chairs of committees, they're also interested and engaged on yeah. those topics. There won't be pushback. The broad, I'm going to solve the mental health issue at my institution, there will be pushback because no one can solve that. Yeah. There's not enough money, resources, or time. I think, Councillor, you had a follow-up. Go ahead. Yeah, actually, I, I agree with everything Chris just said. Uh, this said, uh, I would also add one additional layer is that um, institutions such as universities and colleges as well as you know, just about any other uh, ag agency that's funded by governments, uh, they work within certain frameworks of service delivery. And so if you want institutions like colleges and university to change, uh, they may not be compelled to do so uh, unless government says this is the new regulation and we want you to install this uh, service in your in your institution. And so a great example is the Wynn government created uh, tables and round tables around sexual violence uh, and consent. Guess what? Right across Ontario, uh, universities and colleges were trying to uh, very quickly scale up programs for their population of students uh, because the government said you had to do it. This is no longer, this is no longer a priority of, uh, of the Doug Ford administration in Ontario. So universities, uh, if they're not being asked to do it and they're not being directed to do it and the funding's not going to be there to do it, they're going to probably scale back and that's what we're going to see over the next four years as that no longer becomes their priority. So adding on top of what Chris just mentioned is that we also have to make sure that, you know, not, as, not only is the support peer-to-peer -peer, um, institution for populations that they're serving specifically, but also that governments are responsive uh, to the population overall. And, uh, and universities are very sensitive creatures. Uh, colleges are very sensitive creatures to provincial legislation or territorial legislation. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Councillor. It's, it's such a good point that, that you're making. I'm seeing Chris and I like nodding. Renell's like, yes, yes. Um, and, and it's so important, right? And I, I, I completely agree with you. And, and I, I have so many things. You know, I'm just like geeking out up here. Like these three are so wise. I've learned so much in talking with them the last week. Um, so I'm just excited. I hope I hope you all are just like fiercely he said writing wise. notes. What's that? You said wise. You again. said wise. I said wise. They're wise. You're They're not even wise. that much older. <laughs> They're just wise. Thank you. Um, so I have a, I do I have so many follow ups. I want to get back to that point, Chris. Though first, I, I want to talk about. So we're talking about pushback in institutions. We're talking about how to engage those allies. We're talking about how to get there. Right. I was wondering if you could share with our audience one of your success stories one time that this worked well and, and something that we saw change at McGill University. Sure, I, I can take no credit for this, but I'm happy to talk about it. Um, McGill recently announced a, 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 a Rossi a Wellness Hub initiative, $14 million invested into um, mental health and wellness broadly at the university. This was co-created with students. Uh, students were part of the conversation years ago that led to a push to administration, a recognition of the size of the issue, and the need to um, work carefully around how we think about supporting student wellness. So the idea of this hub is essentially, instead of, you all know that if you, sometimes when you go to your student services, whatever it looks like, you have to choose which door to go in. Do I go to counseling? Do I go to financial aid? What, what do I go to health? What's my issue? They gotta turn that around. The idea is you go to one place and, and you have someone guide you to the right kind of care. And that's really the idea is it's a collaborative care model where it's not saying that, that uh, uh, one on one therapy is the answer in all cases. It will be in some cases, but in some cases it's actually about group therapy. In some cases it might be um, you know, online therapy. In some cases, it might be peer support. And so an example, the peer support center is directly integrated into the wellness hub. Peer support is an absolute essential and vital part of support for students. We know that. So the wellness hub was essentially by a donor uh, inputting a great amount of resources into creating a physical and virtual space that helps uh, uh, with this collaborative care model and this it has spokes and the spokes are individual 
uh, wellness advisors that are in the faculties themselves, because that's where students are, are living in, and doing their programs is in faculties. So it's a hub and spoke model, and it's built of this, this idea of not having to decide yourself, but having a guide in terms of how, how the, what kind of support. So that's a success story. Again, I don't take credit for it. This is a lot of other hardworking people, but the, the reason I wanted to talk about it was two main points. Students were involved. They were on the... Uh, the design, construction, consultation phase throughout the whole process, and the peer support center. I want to mention that again. Many of you are involved with some kind of peer support center at your institution. That's so incredibly valuable, and we've seen an increase at McGill and other institutions on how peers can help peers. And having that integrated into such a wellness hub is, is a really powerful, uh, powerful thing. So that's one example, and it's a real success story. But again, it's going to take some years, right? So those involved recognize the long view that this is a one step. It's not going to solve the problem, but it's going to help a lot. One of my favorite stories from, from our Jack the Dog network that I've heard over the years is um, a story about changing a door location. And it was a, a chapter that was really um, passionately advocating for a change to the entrance for the accessibility and like wellness center on their school because the, the door was too, it was like, in a weird place so that everyone would see you. So you would walk into the counseling center and everyone would be staring at you when you'd go to the counseling center. And we know stigma exists and, and that can be scary for many folks and stigma prevents people from accessing help. So without students talking to their administration and talking to their adult allies who are wise, they wouldn't have known to change that door. Nobody knew, right? But, but those students took it upon themselves to be like, this is not working for us as a student population. How can we work to change it? And it was literally as easy sometimes as changing the location of a door. Now, I don't remember what chapter that was, but that story is stuck in my brain since I heard it a couple years ago. And it really brings me to my next point with Renelle. And I, I wanna talk to you about how important um, it is for, you know, we've talked about you with your lived experience and, and talking and being at the center of the conversation. What does that look like for you? I really want to talk about the process, right? Like, what does it look like for you as a youth advocate and, and someone with lived experience? What, what is the process? How did you prepare for your deputation? How do you prepare for meetings with counselor um, Kristen Wong Tam? Like, you know, all these things. Um, take it away, yeah. Yeah, so um, I really had a very grassroots approach so I first just started to research because I really needed to understand what was the landscape. So what were the services out there for young people? How did city council draft budgets? Like how did that process work? Because I, I don't have a political science background. So it involved a lot of just that initial research. And then I just started to reach out. So for me, I'm kind of old school, so I just started to just send emails out so to city councillors, to community leaders, to other activists, and just, you know, can I meet? Can we have a coffee? Can we talk? Um, and I think it's really important when you do that, when you want to engage, when you want to meet with people, you respect their time, understanding that everyone's really busy, they have a lot of things on their table. So I made sure I had the questions, I prepared, understood what I wanted to get out of that meeting with them. And then when I was there, going through the questions, asking a lot of questions, listening, but also one thing that I also made sure to do was I would always ask them, is there someone else you would recommend that I speak with? Because I think it's important to really create that network of allies. And so I know when I, for instance, I met with counselor uh, Christy Wontam, so she knows a lot more about the space, certain things that I don't know. So she can sort of lead me in certain directions to talk to certain people or ask the right questions that I need to do just to know, you know what's going on and how can I best advocate and help and support this cause. So I think that really is one real big piece is first do your research and then just start to reach out to people. And in my experience, people are very generous and people wanna help you. So as long as you reach out and you send out that email, 90% of people will give you the time to talk to you and to share their stories and their advice. Thank you so much. And, and it, it leads me perfectly to, to my next question that I want to throw to both the counselor and, and Chris, in that you folks are, are very busy. You're very, very busy. You have packed schedules. You're, you're very, very important people in your institutions, I think. Um, and it was even, even this, is the, this is the evidence I have, we had to schedule three different calls because we couldn't get you all, we couldn't get you all on the same call. It was so busy with our schedule and Chris's schedule and Rennell's schedule and the counselor's schedule. We we're all over the place. It all worked out in the end, don't worry. So counselor, I, I wanna talk to you first about this. 
you're busy, you have a packed schedule, we want to have a seat at the table, we're going to do the research, we're, like Renell just said, we're going to do the research, we're going to prepare ourselves, we're going to send emails. How can we prepare for a 10-minute meeting? We have 10 minutes to talk to you, we want to share our passion with you. What does that look like? What do you recommend? Um, I would say be extremely strategic. Uh, understand what you need to come out of that meeting. Uh, don't go in there rambling on. Uh, it is very important to recognize that uh, people do care. I know my colleagues do care. Uh, so, but they are also they also have 14 to 16 meetings a day, and they need to know what's what. What do you need? And the question I oftentimes ask, and this is I asked you several times, um, is what can I do for you with the powers that I have? And so therefore, if I'm, so just know who your audience uh, is and then be very, very clear about what you're looking for. And sometimes it's not about asking right up front. Sometimes it's also about developing relationship. Uh, people need to develop trust and relationships. Uh, and, uh, and we all know that change, inst institutional, government, structural change is not uh, a quick fix. If there was a magic wand to make everything better, we would have done it already. Uh, so be part of the solution, and, but, um, uh, but pu push when you need to. Be constructive with your feedback, uh, but also be very clear about what you want out of that 10 or 15 minute meeting. Do you have anything to add, Chris? About that was a, a great answer. I, I would also say uh, have action items from the meeting. Yep. So who's going to do what after that? And then follow up. Because that actually, that accountability is, is really, really important and from both, for both parties. Here's what I'm going to do, here's what you're going to do, we'll follow up with an email in two weeks or whatever the case may be. Many, many projects start and they don't finish just because yeah. there's not that kind of, uh, uh, it's sort of a project management framework, but, but how does it look over time? And that's another key piece. And a meeting can be very, very short. It's just a face-to-face, -face, get to know somebody, set out objectives, shared objectives, strategic, and action items. There are, two, there are two words we use very often in our office, and that's patience and persistence. So even though I have a seat at the decision-making table, I get to vote uh, with the 26 members of council, I also have to be patient and persistent. Yeah. Uh, as I move through the committee structures, I reach out to the community saying, hey, there's a matter that I know it's gonna, that's going to affect your yeah. community. Can you come out and speak to it? I have, I have to reach out to organize the local community so that they can come in, give us their live feedback, and then hopefully um, set the political table to, to switch uh, and shift my colleagues' positions so that they can actually vote in favor of a program that will eventually benefit the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that means that the community has to be ready and quick to pivot when they need to. Absolutely. Chris, I, I want to throw this question to you, and I think we can all talk about it because I know we, we are each passionate um, here about the social determinants, about a holistic approach to our mental health care system. Chris, you and I talked a lot about how we can shift um, our accessibility and our, and our mental health systems to support those who are struggling with a mental illness or disability. Talk to me a little bit about, so the question is, how can I encourage my university to improve accessibility for disabled students when they won't listen to their own disability center? And I want to throw it to the counselor and, and to Chris and, and Renette, like, let's just, let's have a conversation about this. Maybe, Chris, if you want to start off. Well, I think there's, there's a lot of barriers at different levels within any, any institution, and it's important to recognize that the, those pinch points happen all over the place. So it might be, indeed, with, between a disability center and a university. It might be between the student and the university with the disability center working with the student. I mean, it, it's, it's so complex, and uh, I, this is a great question. I don't have a good answer. I think, it's, I think getting involved with something like your Jack chapter is a, is a, a great way, for example. You're all here for a, for a very good reason. Yeah. Getting involved with your faculty student associations or your student union, because sometimes there can be an, an advocacy that, that you, where you need additional allies to, to help that conversation along. So I think in, in some cases, um, so many things are built on misunderstandings and trust is so hard to earn and so easily lost, right? So to me, it's actually a question of how do you, it's a much bigger question about how do you kind of think about building trust and giving people the benefit of the doubt and say there's probably a misunderstanding there. Yeah. How, do we, how do we clear that up? Yeah. How do I approach it uh, not calling out, calling in, uh, right? The so idea we of about, how to, yeah. we talked about that. How do we bring people into a conversation when it's probably a misunderstanding? Yeah. In many cases, so many big issues you realize are the, are the, the result of, of a, a, an early misunderstanding, a, a, a social media post that never should have been posted, yeah. or a this or a that, or a student press piece that was not quite on, or an administrative response that seemed cold-hearted. Yeah. Whatever the case may be, you, you kind of got to 
understand that at the root of that, it's probably just about trying to get a good conversation going and building trust again. Councillor, do, do you have anything to add? Um, yes, uh, it, it is absolutely critical to recognize where people are coming from, and sometimes it is misunderstanding, uh, but we are looking at system change, right? So you mm -hmm. want to be able to change the structure, change how programs and services and policies are developed and delivered. And when it comes to universities, and the same thing for city-owned buildings, um, the, the challenge right now around making buildings more accessible, uh, meeting people where they are with the proper accommodations, is some Sometimes misunderstanding, but there is also a, a active wall of resistance. People, people in systems and governments, institutions, they don't want to change. They're not interested in changing until you push them to change. And so therefore, it's critically important to figure out who your allies are. Um, number one is, is there a, is there a, a provost? That, that gets the, gets the issue? Is there someone within faculty that can be your champion? Can you demonstrate proof of concept that if you were to move that door, some, some of you guys might be really good at CAD. That is not a, a tech vocabulary that I know. Um, but d demonstrate to them what that would look like if you were to redesign it. And, uh, and then be able to figure out where, where your champions inside and outside are. One thing I do know about institutions, um, and, I, and I have been a community activist, before I got elected at, at City Hall, so I used to be uh, one of those people that would be a, ha, holding a placard and yelling at a building. Uh, you know them, you know that type. And, uh, and now that I'm in the seat of government, I know that it does make a difference. Uh, it doesn't always have to be yelling at a building or perhaps you know calling people out, but if you can figure out how to demonstrate proof of concept that it can be done, um, it, uh, it will be done. But people do not know how to make the change. Yeah. That is one thing I'm very clear about, is that don't assume that government or, or even the, uh, the board of governors at university have the ideas or the solutions, because they don't. And so part of your job is to figure out, can you put this to a design studio um, with your urban design class or perhaps uh, architectural uh, class, and then get them to deliver uh, that in a presentation model, get people to provide feedback and eventually someone in the university who's already your champion and there are those individuals across the, set, the, the universities that will be able to pick that up and say this is important to me and, and actually it's going to be important to everybody else and inclusive design should be something that, um, that I believe architects and urban designers and, and, uh, and everybody who works in building science, they should be working toward it anyways. But they're not going to because it's, it, they're not compelled to. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And, and so it sounds like, you know, we talked a lot about call in, call out. It sounds like we're, we're talking about the same thing, right? Like if we're, if we're going to change systems, if we're going to have a seat at our table, because it's our table, we're going to bring something to our table, right? We're going to bring a solution. We're going to bring an idea. We're going to bring tangible, um, actionable strategies that we can actually help implement, right? We're at, we're at the front line. And Renelle, I, I want to talk to you because you're at the front line. What does your pushback look like? What does your advocacy look like? What are the solutions that you're bringing to the table? Yeah, and so I think even to add to the last question is that there's power in numbers. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important, at least in the grassroots sort of level, to find people that support the same cause as you do. So whether that's collecting signatures, whether it's a social media campaign, but collecting a lot of people that are saying the same thing and that are advocating for the same thing is a great way to sort of push back, especially when you're talking about government policy and, and things like that. Um, so I think for myself, and someone who's at the front line, I understand sort of that, that power of the collective. Yeah. And so I try to find other people, other activists, community leaders who also share the same message. And I go together, we go together, we go whether it's going in front of city council, whether it's just protesting, whatever it is, but doing it as a group, because I think a lot of times you need sometimes that public kind of pushback for change to happen. Right, so I know we were talking about this yesterday, that when there was the issue last year with the homeless issue and the winter and it was opening up the armories, there was a lot of pushback from government to do that. But then once a lot of the people in the grassroots and the activists were out there every single day demanding that these armories were opened, there was a shift and a change within government. So I think don't ever underestimate the power of the people. <laughs> I'm so glad you mentioned this because I have news for you all in this room. There's power in this network. We have the power. We're a national network of over 2,500 young leaders across the country, coast to coast to coast. And our revolution is now, which means we have that network. We have that, 
we have that group. We have the we have the people. We can make the change. So thank you so much for saying that. Excellent. I'm seeing a question up there that says, what are important qualities that a leader must have when creating change? What will make me heard? And I think it, it's, a, it's a cool way to kind of start wrapping up our conversation here is, what are some qualities that we can work on? What are some ways that we can be heard? And that's a question right down the row. Whoever wants to jump in can, but, but uh, yeah, let's, let's talk about, maybe Renelle, we'll start with you because again, you're front line, you're doing yes. the work. What does this look yes. like for you? Um, and I think that's a really good question. So what I've learned, as far as leadership, is being able to listen. Um, so I'm a talker, so I like to talk, but it's important to listen, important to understand other people's perspectives. And because I don't know, you know, I know the front line, I have that lived experience, but I don't understand necessarily how policies are drafted. I don't understand how they're voted on. And to understand budgets and all those different things, and many things that someone like me may not uh, truly get, but I have to understand that because if I'm just coming into the table and saying, this is what I want, make it happen, and I'm not willing to sort of compromise, then I'm not helping the people that I want to support. And so for me, I think growing in my leadership, it's really important to listen to other people's perspectives and to understand where they're coming from. And I think there has to be that level and that willingness to compromise. Absolutely. Chris, Councillor, do you have anything to add? Um, I, I love what Renelle uh, just said, and uh, on top of listening, I'd say you have to be a great collaborator. Uh, you're going to have to be someone that is magnetic. Uh, you draw people in and you actually amplify their best strengths uh, and you make them feel taller than they are. Uh, a great leader is someone that actually can do that uh, for other people and I find that uh, a lot of times uh, we live in a culture where it's about the I, the, the me and the my. Uh, that has to be thrown out the door. It does not work if all we're doing is just talking without follow-up action. So collaboration is the key. I, I believe it's the key of, gr of moving uh, mountains and growing movements. Grow some movements there, yeah, Chris. Here, how I don't are know what to do that? Those were fantastic <laughs> answers. Um, I, I would add one word, authenticity. Um, I think that you have to be authentic and, and your authenticity shine, will shine through as, a, as such a strong leadership quality and uh, being true to who you are compromise, listening, yes, absolutely, uh, and read a lot of stuff. Learn, I mean, that's so yep. important. I mean, the reason that I love being in, the only reason I didn't get a, a real job, uh, <laughs> people is to try to give me, what job advice do I have? I have no job advice, because I never got a real job, because I stayed at university. But, <laughs> but I love it, because you learn, and learn from, always learn from the people around you. Surround yourself by people that are so bright and articulate, and feed off of that, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. I think my boss is over there saying we have time for one more question, Pratik. Is that one more question? One more? Two more. I can't see what you're, you're waving at me. Two more. Oh my gosh, two more questions. Okay. Okay, let's pull one more from, from the audience then, and then I have a question to, to wrap up. Um, I, I'm, there are so many good questions here. Uh, I, I do really like this question here about, can you tell us about the process of engaging with school admin to change policies and procedures? And we've talked about, you know, finding an ally and, on the Board of Governors, blah, blah, blah. What does that look day to day? What does that process look like? Well, it does take time and energy, right? So there's always a trade-off. You're all very, very busy people. And so recognizing, you know, you're, you're, you're going to have to invest time and energy in, into that process. So what, what does that look like on a day to day? It means trade-offs. It means finding time in your schedule. It means maybe taking one last less course be, and, and instead doing additional work with your, as a mental health commissioner with your faculty student association. Getting involved at the local level is so, so important because uh, often uh, student unions are looking for, looking for students to help engage on yeah. these topics. So getting involved in that way, it does require on a day-to-day -day going to more meetings, yes. Uh, Clearing time in your schedule, yeah. yes. Will it, will it be taxing? Yes, it will. It's really hard work. You all know that. It's hard work when you're uh, 
uh, navigating you know, school and, and your own well-being, maybe you're caring for someone else, and then you also have these additional pressures of additional meetings and the additional you know, stresses of getting ready for that, that meeting where you have to be prepared and strategic and have action <laughs> items and all these things. It's really tiring. So I think yeah. being honest and recognizing it takes, it takes work, but it's really good work, uh, and you'll learn a lot from it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, my, my, final, my final question is for, is for everyone, and we, we can go down the line, but as you may have seen from our very big banner there, our, our theme for this year's summit is Revolution Now. So maybe we'll start with, with the counselor, and, and I would love to hear what your revolution looks like around mental health. Um, a lot of it is about self-care these days. Uh, we live in a city where we're constantly wired. Uh, there's an instant demand of our time. Uh, we need instant gratification. You post something, how many people are liking it? Who's retweeting it? Who's sharing it? Oh my God, am I worth anything? Um, it, 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 it actually, we can't help people if we're not healthy. And so my revolution this year, because I'm actually expecting a baby um, in June. Congratulations, <laughs> counselor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so my, my partner and I are expecting a baby, and I, and I just find that if I am not healthy, and if I can't take care of my own mental health and my own stresses, and we are all susceptible, um, I can't help anybody else. So my revolution this year starts with me, with self-care. And hopefully you, all, all you amazing leaders, oh my gosh, I hope you're actually being very kind and gentle to yourself and remembering that you need to take care of yourself first and foremost before anybody else. Yeah. Renelle? Yeah, so I say my revolution is really being honest. And so I've struggled, I talked before, I have lived experience, I've struggled with mental health issues, I come from that background, but I think for a long time, I was ashamed of that. And I didn't talk about it, I didn't share that with people, because I was able to put on that happy face and go out and work and be successful. And so it's just sort of this past last year that I started sharing my story. I started talking about the experiences that I've been yeah. through and working with young people with similar shared experiences. And I found it so empowering for me, but also empowering for young people and everybody else. And I think we just have to start just being honest. And it's okay to say that you don't feel good. It's okay to say that you're upset or you're depressed or you're anxious, whatever it is, let's just start talking about it more. And I love that that's what Jack Org is about, is talking about mental health, because that brings down the wall. It brings down the stigma, because we all at some point in our life are gonna face some sort of mental health issue. It's normal and that's okay. And the more we talk about it, the more we normalize it. And then it's just like, like to me, I envision the future where someone's saying to their boss or to their teacher or something, listen, I need to take a couple days off for self-care. Mm -hmm. Is as normal as saying, I need to take a couple days off because I broke my foot. Yeah. I mean, mental health, physical health, it's Woo! the same thing. Absolutely. Chris, any, any final thoughts? Your revolution, what does it look like? My revolution. Um, I think there's been a shift in the last several years from an oppositional uh, approach to uh, mental health within institutions to a collaborative approach. I yeah. think there's been a real shift. I, I, I've, I've seen it, I can feel it, and I think the revolution is that there's a recognition of a shared goal and let's figure out how to get there. And that's re it's a really, really exciting time to be a, a youth leader, uh, to work with allies in your institution, to make change, to get involved. It's super exciting, and uh, I, I'm very, very optimistic about the future. That's the revolution. That's the revolution. He's optimistic, Rennell's optimistic, the counselor's optimistic, I'm optimistic, we all should be too, because we're starting cool stuff here today at Jack Summit. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Chris, thank you, Rennell, thank you, counselor, for being here. We are changing systems with these adult allies, and we need to go home and, and find these people and start this revolution and have a seat at our table. So thank you so much. Thank you.